everybody for joining the National Health Council's webinar series on clinical outcome assessments. Um, this month, we are featuring another important topic, an introduction to clinician reported outcomes, or ClinRows. And we're very pleased that our guest this month will be Dr. John Power. So I will just provide a little bit of an introduction and recap on clinical outcome assessments and introduction to the NHC before I turn it over to Dr. Powers. Um, another just um, quick housekeeping item is that you're welcome to ask questions through the chat function, um, which is um, on the little bar if, you're, if you have WebEx downloaded. Um, just send any questions that you have through the chat. We will receive those questions and we'll hold off until the end, but at the end we will have plenty of time for Q&A with Dr. Powers. Um, so just a reminder that this is a webinar hosted by the National Health Council. Um, the intent of this COA series is to help our patient group members learn about clinical outcome assessments so that they'll be prepared to engage as um, patient report outcomes and other types of um, clinical outcome assessments become more patient-centered and there's a greater emphasis on them in drug development. Um, so today's agenda, um, we'll go over the objective um, and review a couple of key themes as we always do at the beginning of these webinars. And then I will introduce Dr. Powers. He will discuss and introduce ClinRows, explain why they're important, and also describe the different types of ClinRows that there are, provide a quick review, and then we will mute, move into questions and answers. Uh, again, through the chat function, uh, please feel free to submit those questions and we'll be taking them at the end. And then we'll introduce the October topic speaker as well as the date. So again, the objective for today's webinar is to provide an introduction to ClinRows and describe how they are related to what patients report as being most important to them. And just to recap, um, clinical outcome assessment, or COA, it's an umbrella term, and the FDA defines it as um, a measures, something that measures a patient's symptoms overall mental state or the effects of a disease or condition on how the patient functions. Um, so essentially a COA tells you something about how a patient feels or functions. And recall that there are four different types of measures that fall under the COA umbrella. Uh, these include patient reported outcome measures, clinician reported outcome measures, observer reported outcome measures, and performance outcome measures. And uh, we started this series in November of last year, and so we've covered many topics related to the different, uh, especially patient-reported outcome measures. And so if you're interested in learning more about the other types of measures, feel free to take a look at our website. We have all of the past webinars archived, as well as corresponding blogs published. Um, and just another reminder, um, we have a full hour dedicated to this topic, but it's always important to remember that patient-centered and patient-reported outcomes aren't necessarily the same. Um, there's overlap, but they aren't always going to be 100% overlapping. Um, so remember that a patient-centered outcome is simply outcomes patients report as important to them whereas patient-reported outcomes are outcomes reported only by the patient on how they feel or function. Um, so this webinar, again, will be featuring ClinRows, and so um, you may learn a little bit more about um, settings where a patient-centered outcome might not be a patient-reported outcome. Uh, so with that, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Powers. Um, Dr. Powers is a physician and an investigator on faculty at um, the George Washington University. As it relates to COAs, he was also co-author on the guidance for patient reported outcomes and chair of the International Society for Pharmacoeconomics and Outcomes Research Clinical Outcomes Assessment Task Force. 
Um, so with that, Dr. Powers, I'd like to turn it over to you. Great, thanks very much. And thanks for the invitation today. Um, if you wanna move on to the next slide. <clears throat> so um, while many medical interventions work via changing an enzyme, killing a bacteria, shrinking a tumor, increasing antibody levels, that's their mechanism of action. But what we're really concerned about today and what you've been hearing about in other webinars in this series is what are the ultimate goals of giving anyone a medical intervention? And, and really, it's actually quite simple. It's really to help people live longer and or live better. So then the question comes up, how do you measure whether a medical intervention actually does that in the setting of a research study? Now, although we're going to talk about clinical research today, one of the things I'd really like to get across to you is that if we really put these tools to their ultimate usage would be to expand them outside of the research setting and start to use these things in the setting of clinical practice. I was telling Dr. Perfetto yesterday when we were practicing for this, I actually broke my finger playing basketball, went to the orthopedic surgeon, and I walked in and the nurse handed me an iPad, which actually had a patient-reported instrument on it for me to code in my symptoms. And when I got in to see the doctor, they were all printed out for him for me to discuss with him. So I really think that we're, although we're talking about research today, there are really some utility for these things beyond the setting of research. Next slide. So um, you saw the previous slide on clinical outcome assessments, but let's take an even one step further back. What are the kinds of outcome assessments in general that can be measured in a clinical research study? Well, the first one is very simple. Is the person alive or dead? That's survival. And in this case, we're talking about all-cause survival, meaning whether the person is alive or not, regardless of what might have caused their death. Truth be told, it's actually very difficult sometimes to figure out what somebody died of, especially if they have multiple illnesses at the same time. And the other reason why all-cause survival is important is because a, a drug may actually harm someone because it doesn't treat the disease very well or because the side effects of that drug actually may kill somebody as well. So for instance, there was a recent trial in tuberculosis where the new drug actually increased mortality by fivefold. And when you read the paper in the medical journal, it says, well, these people didn't die of tuberculosis. Well, that may not be relevant if the people died because that new drug had increased side effects. The second category of, of outcome assessments are biomarkers. These are laboratory tests um, or radiological tests like a CAT scan or an MRI. Um, and these things are measured without any judgment. And so survival and biomarkers don't take anyone's judgment to tell whether you're alive or dead or to measure a laboratory value because the machine does that in a standardized way. But clinical outcome assessments all require some form of judgment in making the measurement. And you've already heard about patient-reported outcomes, and today we're going to focus on clinician-reported outcomes. And as the previous slides show you, there are two others called observer-reported outcomes and performance tests. Next slide. So what is a clinician reported outcome? This is a report that comes from a trained healthcare professional after observation of patient's health conditions. So this, as I said, all clinical outcome assessments, including clinician reported outcomes, involve clinical judgment or interpretation of what someone can see, and that means either observable signs like your skin is red, behaviors, like a child with an ear infection tugging on their ear or crying, or other physical manifestations of the disease, which are referred to as signs. That's distinct from symptoms, which is what patients feel that only patients can know. And as a practicing physician, the only way I can know how someone feels is to ask them. I cannot intrinsically know how somebody feels. That's distinct from me, say, looking at their knee and seeing their knee is swollen if they have arthritis. And these are manifestations that are related to the disease or condition. And because a doctor can't or a physician cannot possibly know what a person is feeling, these are, the, you cannot, ClinRose cannot directly assess patient symptoms because those are known only to patients. So these are all indirect measures of what's actually going on with patients. Next slide. So one of the reasons why people tend to use things like biomarkers or clinician-reported outcomes, is that they're concerned about what they call objectivity. In other words, that patients might be biased about their own health status. 
In fact, this really isn't the right way to look at things. As I said, the only person that can possibly know about their own health status is that person themselves. And therefore, that person is the gold standard for their own health. In the setting of clinical research, what people are often worried about is that people's judgments may bias the results of the study if they know what treatment they're actually receiving as a part of the trial. The way to actually deal with that in the setting of research is what's called blinding or masking, meaning that neither the investigators, the physicians, nor the uh, participants in the trial know what they're actually receiving. Unfortunately, what some people translate that into is why we shouldn't use patient-reported outcomes. But on this slide, you can actually see that if you look on the far right, all the patient-reported outcomes, clinician-reported, observer, and performance tests all require judgment. So if what you're worried about is potential bias because of judgments, we don't get out of that box by using a clinician-reported outcome or one of these other COAs. On the other hand, on the left side, we have to look at what is directly meaningful to the patient. Well, a patient-reported outcome of a person's own health is directly meaningful for them, even though it may require judgment. And there's only one outcome which requires no judgment, but it's also directly meaningful to people, and that's all-cause mortality. But how do you use that in a disease that isn't fatal, where it may cause a lot of symptoms for people? So for instance, in urinary tract infections in otherwise healthy women, the death rate for that is essentially zero. However, women experience a lot of pain of burning when they urinate, maybe some pain in their back, pain in their abdomen, et cetera. So many times it's helpful to use something other than all-cause mortality that's still directly meaningful to the patient. On the other hand, a laboratory test doesn't require any judgment, but it may mean nothing to a patient. The laboratory test may look off and in fact, the person's fine. In fact, my mom has a white blood cell count that is always low. She is one of those people who is outside of the normal range, but it's normal for her. So the biomarker really doesn't reflect anything about how she feels. Next slide. So why is it important to get clinician reported outcomes right? And I wanted to show you this paper, which is actually from 1965 from a journal in pulmonary medicine. And uh, I, I thought the first line was interesting. In fact, Dr. Fletcher is a physician, so it's interesting that this comes from a doctor. It says, clinicians tend to ignore their errors because their effects are easily overlooked and consultation with colleagues reduces their effects. But the errors interfere with the accurate diagnosis, which is important for modern research and treatment. And at the bottom, he says, it's important that clinicians, especially when working in isolation, should take steps to reduce observer error. So the issue is, I could look at what's happening to a particular patient and think one thing. Another physician may look at that exact same patient and think something else. So how do you fix that problem? It's to actually come up with standardized measures where you know what you're measuring, explain to people how to measure it, and understand how to interpret those results. So what I'd like to talk to you about for the rest of today is how to develop a proper clinician reported outcome. Next slide. So much of what I'm going to talk to you today, as, as was explained earlier, is in this paper that's listed at the bottom, which was an ISPOR uh, task force on clinician reported outcomes that we published about two years ago. Um, so the goals of this were to define what a ClinRow assessment is and to define the different types of, of ClinRows and actually to come up with some good measurement practices to consider when deciding to use the ClinRows, at least in the setting of clinical research. One of the things that we found when we started out this task force, which by the way, took us four years to do. My daughter started and finished college by the time that we actually got this task force completed. But one of the problems was we found very little research specifically related to ClinRow assessments. On the flip side of it, when we looked through FDA labels, they were really, really common in the setting of clinical research. So isn't it interesting how little research there is on this kind of outcome assessment, yet how common they are? Next slide. So some examples of clinician reported outcomes, and again, remember, these are things that an investigator in a clinical research study can see. So for instance, if you have a skin infection, um, measurement of the size of the lesion is a clinician reported outcome because the clinician is the one sitting there with the ruler who's doing the measuring. Leishmaniasis is a disease that's actually common in the military when people get deployed to the Middle East where they get bitten by a sand fly and they get this skin infection. And so the outcome used in that is resolution of swelling, redness, and erosion 
um, at the place where the fly bit you where the infection occurs. Um, bacterial conjunctivitis is a really common infection in little kids. My mom's a kindergarten teacher and has been a kindergarten teacher for 60 years. She must get this like every couple of years because it's so common in little kids and it's really highly contagious. So the, the outcome used in this is often absence of three clinical signs, and that is absence of pus coming out of the eyeball and absence of redness in both the whites of the eye and also in around the eyelid as well. Which of these are direct measures of patient benefit? Answer, none of them. They're all what somebody is looking at, but notice none of these relate to pain, ability of the person to function in their life. And, and as we presented in the very first slide, that's really what we're trying to evaluate here. So that relieves the question of what patient benefit do these actually capture then? Next slide. So the really first question then to ask is when would a clinician reported outcome be appropriate? Because these are indirect measures, the best place to use these is when clinicians can make accurate assessments of observations that reflect how the patient feels or functions in their daily life. Or sometimes it's something that the clinician may look at now, which may predict survival in the future. So for example, if a uh, investigator takes out their stethoscope and listens to the person's lungs and hears wheezing, that is a physical sign. And the idea is that that is supposed to reflect a symptom such as shortness of breath, or, or trouble breathing in the patient. So patients are not listening to their own lungs. Um, this is something that's done by the clinician or the investigator in the trial. But let's think first, are there situations where another measure, like a patient reported outcome measure, would be preferable if you could directly assess the patient's health status? Isn't it always better to look directly at something rather than try to look in the rear view mirror and take a guess of what's there? And research actually shows, as we found during that is for task force, that many indirect measures of physical signs don't reflect well how patients are feeling or functioning. And I always think of what my mirror, side mirror says on my car, it says objects in the mirror appear closer than they really are. And I always think about that, that that's not really reflecting what's going on. And it's the same thing with, with indirect measures. And that's all of them, not just ClinRose, but all indirect measures like biomarkers, performance tests and observer reported outcomes may not really reflect what's actually going on. So the real first question is, are there settings where this like ClinRO is appropriate? And you can think of places where they might be. So for instance, when a person can't self-report, such as in small children, it might, that might be a place where you would want to evaluate signs that um, reflect what's actually happening to the person rather than uh, um, talking to the person themselves because you can't in that particular setting. So, but this is a really important part in terms of patient engagement. Um, when we did the ISPOR task force report, it became very clear to us that there were numerous places where clinician reported outcomes were being used where a patient reported outcome may actually have been preferable. So let's get back to when I was talking about urinary tract infections in healthy young women. The FDA's guidance on this says that the outcome measure should be signs and symptoms plus a urine culture result. Well, signs are not what's happening to the patient in the urinary tract infection, and it's not really clear what sign you would be looking at anyway. Um, and then a urine culture, of course, is a biomarker. So what's really important there, though, is what the woman is actually feeling when she has a urinary tract infection. So why are we using signs and a laboratory test when actually the patient reported outcome would be the proper thing to use in young healthy women that can self-report. So this is really an important role of patient engagement to try to move things toward the appropriate measure. And, and let's face it, the way the world works is that people often rely on precedent. And that is why are those measures being used in urinary tract infections? Because that's the way it's been done. And the role of patient engagement here would be really helpful to move things toward a more patient-centered way of evaluating the effects of these interventions. Next slide. So what are the types of clinician reported outcomes? And we divided these up into three types as a part of the ISPOR task force. One is a reading. And a reading, just to make it really simple, is a yes-no answer. 
So for instance, if you are looking at an x-ray to see if somebody has a fracture, do they have a fracture or don't they? That's a yes, no answer. Do they have a skin lesion or don't they? Or counting up the number of episodes. For instance, the emetic means vomiting. So counting up the number of times somebody vomited and observing that as a part of the trial. Ratings are something that you give a score to. So instead of a yes or a no, it would be how big is somebody's spleen? So that would be a measurement that's got various categories or various scores or something like improvement in the appearance of somebody's veins if they have varicose veins. And again, there's another one. Um, wouldn't it be better to ask the patient themselves how about their improvement in vein appearance rather than having it measured by somebody else? So, and then the third category is actually quite problematic, and these are called clinician global impressions. And in a reading and a rating, what is actually measured is being defined, but in a clinician global, it's really more doctor says you look good, quote unquote. And it's really not clear what is being measured and how it's defined, and therefore that leaves it up to individual investigators to make those decisions. And as I said earlier, the whole point of having clinician reported outcomes is to try to standardize what's being measured, how it's measured, and how to interpret it. And that's very challenging for these clinician globals because what's being measured is left up to the individual person. And oftentimes what may, the clinicians may measure may include things like biomarkers or laboratory tests. So you're not even sure what's going into this or how the judgments are being made. And one of the things we recommend in the ISPOR task force report is to try to move away from clinician globals and to transfer them into either readings or ratings by defining what you're being measured better. Next slide. So again, we said since most clinicals are indirect measures of benefits to patients, one of the things that you have to do with a clinician reported outcome that you don't have to do for a patient reported outcome measure is specify upfront what direct measure the ClinRO is a substitute for. So I'm an infectious disease specialist, so we actually did a study and published it a couple of years ago where we looked at the correlation between pain and lesion size and skin infections, and it turns out there's a really good correlation. Now, having said that, I still don't understand why we need to use lesion size. We can just ask the person whether they're in pain. So we're in the process now of developing a patient-reported outcome for skin infections. And by the way, the other place where patient engagement can be helpful is oftentimes what you'll hear people say is, well, we have to use lesion size because a patient-reported outcome instrument doesn't exist for this disease. And you folks can be instrumental in helping to get those developed and studied. So on the other hand, there are studies which actually show a poor correlation between clinician-derived symptoms and quality of life and survival in HIV AIDS. So in other words, those studies actually showed that what the clinicians think is important actually was not as good a predictor of what happened to people in the long run as what patients thought about their own health. Next slide. So the other thing is, and I've been told that you've already listened to uh, webinars about context of use and concepts of interest. These come up in the setting of clinician reported outcomes as well. For instance, are different things important to different kinds of patients? In other words, do people earlier in the stage of an illness find things important that is different than people in a later stage of an illness? And that's called context of use. The next thing is what is actually being measured by the clinicians and how is it measured? And those are the concepts of interest. So for instance, in the study that we published looking at the correlation between pain and lesion size, we looked at three different ways of measuring skin lesions. In other words, measuring it top to bottom in your body or measuring it at the widest part of the skin lesion. Turned out it didn't matter. No matter which way you measured it, it came out pretty accurate. But we wouldn't have known that if we didn't look at actually how to do those measurements the right way. The next thing, is the right thing being measured and do clinicians actually understand what's being measured? And this is important even in PROs, that different words mean different things to different people. And I always joke about this, that I remember when I was an intern, after I had just graduated from medical school, I was in the emergency room and I asked a patient, so what brought you in here today? And she looked me dead in the eye and said, my car. And I learned from that, that people are oftentimes very, very literal. And so you have to be very clear that what you're asking people is understood by them. And this goes for clinicians, just like it goes for patients. We've already talked about the challenges with clinician globals, and that also applies to clinician actions. 
So for instance, what we found in the ISPOR report was that many times clinical trials use outcomes like doctor's decision to prescribe additional medications or doctor's decision to put someone in the hospital or doctor's decision to transfer someone in or out of an intensive care unit. And in truth, we don't even know what's being measured there. What's going into those clinician decisions is really opaque, and it's not at all clear why they're making those decisions. And I can tell you as a practicing clinician that my decision-making is often different than the next clinician, which is often different than the next clinician. So it's really important to try to standardize those things and move away from these things like clinician globals and clinician actions because we don't know what they're actually measuring. Next slide. So after we've done those things, then it's important to actually test the measurement properties of the instrument. So for instance, this is like having a thermometer on your back porch and you wanna see that it actually measures the, the temperature accurately from day to day. And in this way, we actually look at do different clinicians get similar measurements and does the same clinician get similar measurements if they're measured over and over again? And this is called inter and intra-rater validity. And this is actually something you don't have to do with a patient reported outcome because as I said previously, the patient is the reference standard for their own health. So this is again, an additional thing that you have to do for a ClinRO that you don't have to do for a PRO. Next slide. And then after we get beyond measurement properties, how do you interpret the measurements you actually get? What's considered a successful outcome for a patient and what statistical methods are used to analyze those results? Now, as a physician, I always like to see results presented in how many people got better. But sometimes clinical trials actually analyze the differences in scores between the groups, which is called group mean differences. Those scores are really not that meaningful to me or to most clinicians. So to say group A had an average change in score of two points takes it away from being patient-centered and actually makes it more about the score than it does with patients. So my preference is the first bullet there to tell me X percent of people got better in this group compared to the other treatment. Next slide. So then, and one of the other important things to think about in the setting of a clinician reported outcome is how to actually train people to use those measurements properly in the setting of a clinical trial. And this usually entails developing a standard operating procedure, putting it in a manual, training the investigators, really being clear on who the investigators are going to be. When people think about clinical research, they often think it's A, a physician, and B, that it's the same person evaluating someone in the study from one visit to the next to the next. In reality, it's often not a physician, and it may be a different person from visit to visit. So implementing that is very important, and you need to know that going in. And again, documenting of what to train and how the training is done is really important so that you can assess that people actually understood what they were being asked to do in the setting of the clinical research study. Next slide. So what I explained to you there was a more plain language summary of the seven things that we actually put into the ISPOR good measurement properties for development and use of clinician reported outcomes. And that is first, defining the types of patients you're gonna use it in, two, defining what you're actually going to measure, three, explaining how those indirect measurements of a ClinRO assess direct treatment benefit for patients, documenting that you're measuring the right thing in terms of content validity, looking at the other measurement properties, in other words, do uh, the same clinician or different clinicians get similar measurements, how you're gonna interpret and analyze those results in the setting of a clinical research study, and how you're going to implement them. So all these things are spelled out in this reference that's at the bottom if you wanted to read more about this and the details of how to get into this. Next slide. So let's summarize then, this is my last slide, and then I'll be happy to take questions. Um, Clinician reported outcomes are one type of clinical outcome assessment that can be used in various types of research studies. But again, we need to be clear on when it's appropriate to use a clinician reported outcome. And our assessment in the ISPOR task force showed that oftentimes they're used when in fact a patient reported outcome may be more, more beneficial. One of the things I found of interest was I was working at FDA in 2006 when we presented the initial draft of the patient reported outcome uh, guidance. 
It was interesting that some people came up to the microphone and said, when is FDA going to apply these same principles to clinician reported outcomes? And I always thought that was a really good question because as I've pointed out to you in this talk, there are actually more things that you need to do to evaluate a clinician reported outcome than there are for a patient reported outcome. And so uh, that realization I don't think is hit home yet. And it's one of the things that you as patient engagement folks can help with that the default when there isn't a patient reported outcome instrument should not be a clinician reported outcome whose validity is even less clear than the patient reported outcome. And since these are all indirect measures of patient benefit for evaluating medical interventions, you need evidence to evaluate what part of patients living longer or living better they relate to and how well they do that. These good measurement practices are as important for ClinRows as they are for any other type of clinical outcome assessment, including PROs. And the development of these clinical outcome assessments based on these good measurement principles can help ensure that study results are accurate, meaningful, and interpretable for patients. One of the other things that I want to bring up here is that if you actually come up with a more accurate measurement, regardless of which one of these COAs it is, it actually decreases what's called statistical variance. In other words, there's less random error in the measurement. When you do that, you need fewer participants to enroll in a trial to actually show a benefit. So there is a benefit to all of this because they make trials more efficient. And the increasing the efficiency of studies can decrease variability and because of the better measurement properties. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention too is, um, clearly you folks all know that in the news, there is a lot of discussion about the cost of medical interventions. Uh, the way I look at this is if you don't know that a medical intervention actually benefits a patient, in other words, if it shrinks a tumor, but you don't know whether it actually prolongs their life or heaven forbid makes them more miserable during the time that they remain alive, why is that worth paying anything for? N not talking about degree of cost. Why pay anything for an intervention that doesn't help people if all we know about it is that it changes some laboratory test when we're missing the evidence on whether it's actually beneficial to helping people live longer or live better? So this all has implications for the cost of medical care as well. And again, lastly, some points of emphasis or difference between ClinRows and PROs is again that we need evidence on that relation to direct patient benefits, and there are some differences in evaluating measurement properties, namely that inter and intra-rater variability of looking at whether different investigators get the same measure or whether the same investigator can get the same measure when done over and over again. So I think that's my last slide here. Let's go to the next one. And I'll just pause at this point, and hopefully I can answer any questions for you, and hopefully that's helped answer some questions for you today already about clinician reported outcomes. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Powers. That was a very clear summary. I have to apologize for the sirens in, in the background here in Washington. Um, we had a couple of questions that came in. So let me, um, let me pose one of the questions to you and, sorry, I'm just gonna let the siren pass for a moment. <laughs> really bad timing. Um, and then just a reminder to everybody as we wait for the ambulance and police and fire trucks to go by, um, if you wouldn't, if you have any questions, please do go ahead and submit them via the chat function on WebEx. Um, okay, so one of the questions that had come in was um, was related to the clinician globals. Um, you mentioned them a couple of times, and the question was was quite simple: was what are they used for in research, and also what are they used for in general practice? Sure, that's a great question. So. In general practice, and remember, one of the things I made the distinction at the very beginning was the distinction between practice and research. In practice, I often ask a patient, so how do you feel today? That's a clinician global question. Um, and they're fine for practice just to try to get a gestalt feeling of how somebody's doing. But in the setting of research, you really want to be clear about what you're measuring and how you're measuring it. And the example I use is, suppose I went into a laboratory and I took everybody's test tubes away and I took all the pipettes away. And I said, you know what? I want you to put five milliliters in this little flask, but I want you to eyeball it. Well, nobody would be happy with that. They'd say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Give me back my pipettes so I can actually do this accurately. So 
Um, I think oftentimes what's happened is in the past, and, and I'll be very upfront about this as a, as a physician myself, I think a lot of this is derived some, from some, some parentalism in medicine where people have said, well, doctor knows best. And instead of actually specifying what should be measured, because, you know, this disease is complex and can cause many problems, we'll just leave it up to the clinician because the clinician knows his or her patient. Well, that's fine for clinical practice. No problem with that. But it really doesn't cut the mustard when you're talking about a clinical research study where you want to be really clear on what benefits you're actually getting for patients. So I, that's a great question about the distinction between practice and research. And I think we've been trying to move away from those in research, but the ones that I really worry about are the, are the hidden clinician globals that I told you about. And in other words, people don't think that clinician globals are things like doctor's decision to prescribe another medicine because they can count up how many patients got another medicine. So they see that as a quote, objective measure. But in fact, we often do not know why clinicians decided to give that medication. We did a study a couple of years ago where we actually tried to capture why clinicians made those decisions. And in that study, we found 60% of the clinicians said, I don't know. <laughs> so if the clinicians aren't even clear why they're giving this medication, how do we know that that reflects patient benefit? So really, it's not saying that, you know, it's not giving the medication may be important, but what we really want to capture is the reason for why the medication was given, not merely the fact that it was given. Hopefully that makes sense. Thank you. Um, and then you had mentioned um, that some ClinRows used in the past and, and today don't measure things that are important to patients. What, if anything, is being done to limit their use in clinical trials today? That's a great question. And I think that's the job for you folks that are on this call to try to limit their usage in clinical practice or to decide, help get the evidence to decide which ones are really relevant to patients and which ones are not. So in the past, a lot of these clinician reported outcomes that were used, the issue of what direct patient benefit does it reflect doesn't even come up. And so for instance, we've known for years for biomarkers like progression-free survival in oncology, that what we're trying for that to reflect is overall survival. When you go to look at some of these clinician-reported outcomes, it's not clear at all what direct measure it's trying to reflect in patients. So that's a problem right there, that you don't even know what it's actually supposed to be measuring. And let's be clear, a lot of these clinician-reported outcomes that look at signs of disease are really measuring a biological effect of the drug. That's not what we care about. Remember I said in the very first slide, um, biological effects and mechanisms of action are not the goals of therapy. It's I want to know how that biological effect reflect, helps somebody live longer or live better. So if somebody's knee swelling goes down and they still can't walk and their knee still hurts like the Dickens, what have we actually accomplished for them? So I, I think, and like I said, when we actually did this literature review for this Is Poor Task Force, what we found was very little and very poor information on how clinician reported outcomes reflect patient benefits. So that's the job for you guys, to actually demand that kind of evidence, and when it doesn't exist, to tell people they have to get it. Thanks. Um, an additional question is, how do we handle differences in interpretation of disease severity ratings between two or more clinicians, same patient examined within an hour by multiple healthcare providers? They may follow a certain disease guideline severity score, but their interpretation may differ largely. Yep, yep. that is yep. exactly, so that, that is one of the points I brought up about measurement properties of ClinRose. So in other words, what, what you just described to me was something that had poor inter and intra-rater validity. And here's the, here's the crux of the problem, how much error is allowable in those isn't clear because it's how much it actually reflects what happens to the patient. So it gets back again, how much error is acceptable is how much error in that ClinRo is going to reflect how much error in what's actually happening to the patient. So it keeps coming back to that issue of we need to know what it actually means. Um, my own suggestion would be um, 
it, it's interesting. I was having a discussion. I work with a lot of people in the Department of Defense. And yesterday we were having a discussion about Murphy's Law. Murphy's Law actually came from an Air Force guy named Murphy who built a rocket sled. And he put somebody on the rocket sled, turned it on, and it went backwards instead of forwards. And Murphy said um, that what I should have done was built a rocket sled that couldn't go backwards. So Murphy's Law is not whatever can go wrong will go wrong. What he really meant was don't build a system that can go wrong. And so what I would suggest to somebody using a ClinRO like that is develop a better ClinRO. If you have a lot of inter and intra rater variability, then perhaps there needs to be a different measurement. And again, a lot of these severity indices are developed for use in clinical practice, and maybe they work just fine for that setting, but maybe they're not so good in the setting of, of clinical research because of that high variability. So again, that's why you do this kind of work to find out whether there's that amount of error and variability, and maybe you develop a better measure then. A follow-up to that question is also, how do we account for um, clinicians also knowing about biomarkers, signs, x-rays, et cetera, um, that might be related and, and prevent that from factoring into the ClinRO? Oh, that's a great question. So one, you can't. And in fact, that's why clinician globals are, are so challenging. You don't know, you could tell a clinician to look at only X, Y, or Z, but when it's left into a clinician global, you don't know that they went out and looked at the X-ray and the white count and the body temperature and all those other things, and that's what swayed their decision making. And the way to, to get rid of that is twofold. One, you define what's actually measured, and therefore, if people measure that in a standard way, they can't bring in these exogenous things. So in other words, if when we did the study where we measured skin lesion size, you have to measure the size of the skin lesion. You can't say, oh, but I think it's bigger because the person has a fever. That doesn't come into it. So for, no, point number one is define clearly what's actually measured. The second part of it, as I mentioned earlier, is blinding the study. Blinding studies is always better than unblinded studies because especially when you're using an outcome that requires judgment, it's very challenging to prevent people from letting their judgments bias the results of the study. Some studies that were published in JAMA about a decade ago show that the average treatment effect size is about 19% bigger in unblinded trials than in the same intervention studied in blinded trials. So that shows you the degree of bias and how big it might be in the setting of unblinded trials. And that goes for any outcome measure, even all-cause mortality. It's better to blind a trial than not blind a trial if it's at all possible to do. Some settings, it's really challenging to do that. So if you're comparing surgery to non-surgery, Obviously, you're going to know who got, you know, cut open and who didn't. And so there's some places where that's a real challenge. But whenever possible, it's better to blind the study. Thank you. Um, and one just sort of specific question. So I completely understand if you're um, not active in this particular area. But um, the question was, what advances are being made in clin rows um, or potentially other COAs for patient fatigue? Oh, that's a great one. So um, when we wrote the PRO guidance back in 2006, the initial draft, there was a lot of discussion about the concept of fatigue in general. In other words, that it might, um, fatigue might mean a number of different things, sleepiness, lack of energy, et cetera, et cetera. And I think over time, people have come to understand that, that patients are pretty good at understanding what fatigue is. And many illnesses, it's a really primary component of the illness. And so, for instance, we, de we, developed, a, bless you, we developed a patient reported outcome for influenza that we published about two years ago. And when we did the initial patient interviews to develop content validity, fatigue comes way up to the top of the list of what happens to people when they have the flu. And anyone who's had it can tell you that. Um, clinician reported outcomes for fatigue, I'm not as um, familiar with those. I would think that'd be a real challenge to have someone decide whether someone else is feeling fatigue or not. And there's a great example of why, you know, in a setting if patients can self-report where it's better to use a patient reported outcome than a clinician reported outcome. 
what I can say is perhaps there might be some observations that you could make in people who can't self-report that you might indicate in people have fatigue. So, so for instance, if a baby is sleeping more than usual, maybe that's an indicator. I don't know, but you'd have to actually have the information that actually tells you that before you would make that assessment. For instance, one of the things I think is useful in little kids is get kids who are old enough to self-report and then maybe you can extrapolate from that to kids who are a little younger who can't self-report. So if a kid who's older is feeling sleepy and not playing, et cetera, you can extrapolate from, and that that's a reflection of fatigue for that kid, you can extrapolate that maybe to a kid who's younger. Um, so again, this is a place where in patients who can self-report, measures of fatigue are much better done by a PRO than a ClinRO. Thank you. Um, one question is, uh, and I'll move the slide back to, to the relevant slide. Um, but the question was, um, could we go back to the table slide on directly meaningful and objective? Are there examples of the other types of COAs that fit into the upper right-hand box? Um, so where judgment's required and it's directly meaningful to patients? So that's a great question. Um, usually not. And, I, and I, we, when we had the ISPOR task force, we had a lot of discussion about that. So in other words, could a clinician observe something that's directly meaningful to a person, like observing someone have a seizure? Oh, okay, that's, that one would be meaningful, that somebody had a seizure, and somebody else, either an observer or a clinician, watches that happen. So there are some, I think, rare instances of where that actually might be um, possible. But I'm not going to put that on this slide because what, what bothers me when I put things like this together is you can't do things based on the exceptions. Um, you know, and for instance, um, there's an actual great research study that came out about a year ago talking about how for some patients, all-cause mortality is not the most important thing. That if they have a disease that's making them miserable, sometimes they care more about function in their lives than all-cause mortality. Does that mean all-cause mortality isn't meaningful? No. So yes, there are examples of where you could move some of those things that are in the bottom right up to the top right. But on average or in general, the answer to that would be no. Hopefully that's helpful. Thanks. Um, and then one other follow-up question. You've gotten a lot of questions, <laughs> so this is great. <laughs> Good. Good. Uh, the worst thing is when you give a talk and nobody says anything, because either you got it all right or everybody has no idea what you were no talking idea, about. No idea, right? So this is good. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> so um, the next question is, how does a ClinRO differ from the things that my provider documents about me when I go in for a regular office visit, for example, during a yearly physical? Oh, great question. So, you know what's interesting is that if you read the Belmont Report from 1979, which is one of the documents that spells out research ethics in the United States, um, in the very first section, it explains the difference between clinical practice and clinical research. And in clinical practice, you're doing things that are trying to benefit the individual person. And in clinical research, you're actually testing a hypothesis to make generalizable conclusions. So they're really two very different settings. But the real issue here is that, for instance, when I write things down in the chart when I'm seeing a, a person, I may capture things that another physician doesn't ask at all about. So for instance, I'm an infectious disease specialist. We were joking about this yesterday in a meeting I was in. We always ask about travel history because where you have been may impact what kind of disease you have. So for instance, if you are spelunking in caves in Ohio, you might have histoplasmosis as a cause of your lung disease. Now I can tell you orthopedic surgeons ain't gonna ask about that, right? So depending upon who you are or what your focus is, you may ask different questions. And one of the things to really take home about ClinRows is, what we're trying to do here is standardize what questions are asked, how they're asked, how that information is captured and the measurement properties of those things. That is very different in a research setting than what's done in the setting of clinical practice. Now in clinical practice, we're trying to fix that too, right? The whole evolution of electronic medical records is trying to be able to capture information in a standardized way. Let me tell you, as someone who does retrospective research on electronic medical records, we have not achieved that to date. 
it is maddening to try to go through and find data an electronic medical record and find out a the question wasn't asked if it was asked it's missing it's blank on that particular person's chart so right now we have not gotten to that point um, and it's very interesting to listen to people talk about big data but as somebody who does research in there right now what we have is big mess and hopefully at some point we will be able to standardize those measures in clinical practice and that brings me back to what i said on the very first slide one way to do that is to develop these ClinRows and use them in clinical practice, just like we do in the setting of clinical research. But we have not achieved that as yet. And again, there's a great place for patient engagement. And I can tell you that if you actually implement these things in the office setting, like when I broke my finger and went to the orthopedic surgeon, it actually streamlines what's going on in the office. So when I was sitting there filling out this PRO and I got in to see the orthopedic surgeon, I was joking with him about how my time was so better spent filling that out than reading the Sports Illustrated from 1999 that he had out in his waiting room, right? So I felt like my time was actually being used much more um, better than if I was just sitting out there twiddling my thumbs. Thank you. Um, another question that we had was, I am interested in comparing whether a PRO or ClinRO does a better job of measuring the same concept. Um, what approaches would you suggest um, that we follow? So that's really interesting. Um, there are some places where um, you could measure similar concepts, such as dermatology. So for instance, um, many dermatology studies have, are driven by clinician reported outcomes. Um, I had really bad eczema when I was a little kid, and I am very sorry to say it's coming back as I get older again. My wife says I'm becoming a child again. So, um, but, um, and I gotta tell you, I couldn't care less what my clinician thinks about it. I care what I think about it. And so it's interesting to me how the clinician reported outcome is often the primary endpoint in these dermatological studies. Shouldn't the patient reported outcome be the primary outcome? And so one way to do that is to actually measure both in the setting of a clinical trial and see how they line up. Now you're asking somebody who's gonna to default to the patient reported outcome as the reference standard in that setting. I don't think the dermatology division at FDA has gotten to that point yet. And that's yet another place where you guys might want to intervene. Um, but oftentimes, what's measured by the clinician and what's measured in a PRO are actually completely different concepts. So in other words, what a PRO is measuring is symptoms, how the patient feels. What a ClinRO is measuring is signs, which are observable things. So oftentimes, the concepts are completely different. So you're really not sort of measuring the same concept, unless you think that that sign reflects the symptom, which we've talked a lot about today, and that is how to align those, align those two things, especially in the setting of where a patient can't self-report. Hopefully that helps answer that one. That was a good question, though. Thank you. Um, and an additional question that came in is, do you have an opinion about an alternative ClinRO um, for the six-minute walk test? Well, that's actually a performance test. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know that you've, t you've talked about those yet. Have you guys? You haven't done the webinar on those yet. Not in detail, no. Okay, so stay tuned. <laughs> you guys can come back and talk <laughs> about that one because that's not a ClinRO. That's a performance <laughs> test where the, a patient is being asked to perform a task. So I'm not going to get into that one today. Great. Um, well, that was the last question that we had come in. So thank you, everybody, for being active and presenting such great questions to Dr. Powers. And thank you so much, Jack Rowers, also for being so engaging and also adding humor in um, to, the, to the discussion. Um, I wanted to just make everybody aware of our next, um, in the next webinar in our series. It will be on October the 10th. Um, and it will be about clinical outcome assessments, um, should one build new or adapt an old um, COA measure. And it will be featuring Stacey Hutchins, who's the CEO and strategic lead 
um, regulatory access at clinical outcome solutions. Um, so we're really looking forward to that. And um, just want to thank you again, um, Dr. Powers, for participating today. Um, we will have the recording of this webinar online if anybody wants to listen in again. or. Um, and then we'll also have a blog about it going up in a couple of weeks. So stay tuned for that. And as always, we have our little survey. If you have suggestions for topics that we should be covering as part of one of these webinars, please feel free to submit it. Um, and with that, I will wish everybody a nice afternoon and a nice weekend coming up. Thank you.